Hey everyone, so this week's news from the fanatical futurist and 311institute.com exponents blogs. Some of the news that I'm going to share with you, and this is emerging technology news and science news, I see is positively science fiction like some news you've already heard before, and the rest of the news is uh, just news. Now, we're going to start here. So, firstly, Google released their answer to ChatGPT and GPT 4 from OpenAI. Uh, they released their own new large language model called Gemini. Now, Gemini is a multimodal LLM, and as such, basically, it recognizes sound, pictures, videos, images, and so on and so forth. Now, when we actually have a look at its capabilities, as you can kind of see here, um, so if you click into the article, then eventually it opens up, um, there's a whole variety of things, basically, that this thing can do. Now, on the one hand, they've sort of been playing around with these kinds of uh, sort of gimmicks, you know, where, for example, if you have a look at this one over here, you can draw an instrument or set of instruments. Uh, you can then suggest a style, basically, for that particular drawing. And then Google Gemini will go off and actually create some guitar-based rap music, which is appropriate, basically, for beach time, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's actually kind of quite cool. Um, when we actually have a look at this particular one, scientific literature, um, one of the main use cases of ChatGPT was originally to summarize huge volumes of text. Now, whether that's emails, research notes, whether it's meeting notes and so on and so forth. And in this particular one, they actually, in this particular example, uh, Google ended up summarizing 200,000 pages of scientific text in just a couple of minutes. Now, if you think about real world applications, for example, in healthcare, you know, we see huge amounts of new healthcare research coming through every single day. And as humans, there's no way that we can actually keep up with that. So increasingly, artificial intelligence being able to summarize, should we say, new information uh, very quickly and in a succinct way is actually a game changer in my view. Um, now, when we also have a look at things like coding, so increasingly Gemini is excelling at competitive coding. And in Google's case, they now say that Google Gemini is very, very close to being a master coder. Now, what that means is that if you're a programmer, you actually do need to start looking over your shoulder. And while we all know basically that when you're actually writing software, there's a lot more to it than just writing the code itself. You know, you need to understand the brief, what you're trying to achieve, the audience that you're actually creating, whatever it is you're creating for. To be honest, you do need to start looking over your shoulder, um, which then sort of brings us on to things like, you know, the future of education and so on and so forth, which I talk about now. Uh, over here, we've got new quantum microscopes. So you've heard of quantum compasses by now. You've heard of quantum computing and quantum sensors, which are 100 million times more sensitive than any sensors on the planet. Quantum microscopes let us see the smallest things in cells. So this is cytoplasm. So things like membranes. Uh, they can also let us see the things that are currently invisible in materials to help us create new drugs, new materials, and new, new things, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's the first quantum microscope that I've actually seen. Now, when we actually have a look at this one, so I did say that there were going to be some positively science fiction-like pieces of news. Uh, this one, yeah, you know, I've seen these on the boil for a little while now, but this is the first time I've ever actually seen this capability coming together in a single emerging technology. Now, these are DNA robots, so they are DNA nanobots, and they can do a couple of things. So firstly, they're programmable, which means we can get them to do different things depending on what we want them to do in the first place. Now, on the one hand, we can actually get these DNA nanobots to assemble new nanoscale products. Now that could be new materials, it can be all kinds of different things. It could be other little molecular machines as I've talked about before. Uh, however, these little DNA robots basically are able to self-replicate. So this kind of starts getting us a little bit closer to things like programmable matter and programmable material, uh, but also weird biological smart dust. So if you ever watch the science fiction movie Promethean, and we saw you saw the grey goo, um, then yeah, we start verging on that. You know, that's a bit of a different story. But nevertheless, 
programmable DNA nanobots that can make new materials and replicate themselves while moving around and doing things? Let's see, what are they going to get up to in the future? Um, now, this one here, uh, in a world first, laser beams have been deflected just by air. Researchers over in the United States created a mesh of air using ultrasound waves to deflect really quite strong laser beams. Now, around four years ago, I talked about some of British Aerospace's first attempts to create force fields. So if you ever saw Independence Day with Will Smith, you know, you've seen force fields in action in a variety of different science fiction like movies. However, you know, what's sort of interesting about this, basically aside from the fact that we can deflect laser beams just by air, is again, this is a world first. So as we start seeing the development of laser weapons that are being attached to everything from the US Zumwalt class destroyers all the way through to the F-35s, F-16s, as well as the Chinese J-22, um, as well as the United States striker military vehicles and so on and so forth. So as we see laser weapons increasingly encroaching on the battlefield, this is actually one way that in the future we might be able to stop some of those laser weapons. So force fields are real. And another sort of odd one here is they actually use the same acoustic hologram technology of ultrasound uh, as we've seen in ultrasound tractor beams as well. So with that particular piece of news, you almost get two pieces of science fiction for one. So now, uh, what have we got down here? Uh, now, this is actually sort of an interesting one again. So Open, OpenAI is actively seeking companies to partner with uh, who will give it access or give the company access to private data sets. Now, you might wonder basically, why they actually want that. Now, there's a couple of reasons. So firstly, this article here, um, most of the artificial, most of the large foundational artificial intelligence models that we see today have already been trained on the vast majority of freely available data. So I typically think Reddit, Twitter, the internet, you know, all that kind of different stuff. And there are an increasing number of experts that fear that by the year 2026, we are going to run out of data to train our artificial intelligence models on. Now, on the one hand, that means that increasingly we're seeing the rise of synthetic data being created by the likes of generative artificial intelligence, again, which I've talked about before in lots of keynotes and so on and so forth. Um, but the reason why, our, why OpenAI want access to private data sets is because public information only gets you so far. If you want to create an artificial intelligence model that has deep domain expertise in a particular field, like, for example, law or tax or science or whatever it happens to be, industrial control systems and so on and so forth, then public data only gets you so far and you need access to high quality private data. Now, on the one hand, OpenAI also think that this is one of the ways that they can achieve artificial general intelligence with kind of GPT-5, GPT-6. So I think AGI will be more in the realm of GPT-6, GPT-7 than GPT-5, but we can have a conversation there. I know lots of people say AGI is already here. And when we have a look at OpenAI's Master of Experts model, as I've again discussed before, you're not too far off. That's it. But you are jumping the gun. You know, so um, now another piece of artificial intelligence news uh, so this is out of the University of Cambridge, and frankly, this is really left field. I mean, again, we can say this is a little bit like science fiction incarnate. So researchers at the University of Cambridge's Artificial Intelligence Lab decided that they wanted to try to constrain artificial intelligences. Now, OK, what does constrain really mean? It means put limits on their artificial intelligence. Um, now, one of the limits that they actually put on their AIs was space. So they created a 3D space, yeah, a spatial space, 
um, to run their neural network artificial intelligences in. And some of these artificial intelligences were separated by distance. So in exactly the same way that neurons in the human brain are separated by distance. And what they actually found was that when artificial intelligences are constrained, whether it's by physical limits, computational limits, memory limits, you know, so on and so forth, these AIs self-organized and they ended up creating features and capabilities that were very, very similar. So very similar, yeah, underscore that, to the human brain and the way that complex organisms' brains work. So in this particular example, they actually talk about quite literally creating a synthetic or artificial brain. Now, if we just go slightly off piste with this particular piece of news, what happens in the future if the artificial intelligences that you're putting into your company are constrained in some way? Now, on the one hand, I say they could end up exhibiting some rather strange uncharacteristic behavior, which might actually give you some problems, especially when we have a look at the outputs of these AIs and so on and so forth. But consider this, you might actually already be plugging in what will become a synthetic brain into your company's ICT and operational technology stack. Have fun with that as a conversation. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, now, in addition to that, when we actually have a look at other sort of GPT large language models, uh, we've got DarkBert. Um, now, DarkBert GPT is kind of exactly what it says on the tin. Now, when we have a look at OpenAI's chat GPT, that was trained on legally available public information, which generally was about everything from cats to leadership and so on and so forth. Dark Bert, and there's a couple of others like Fraud GPT and so on and so forth, were trained on data from the dark web. So these dark web trained artificial intelligence models are very good at creating new malware, new scams, and all kinds of different things. So think just how good ChatGPT is for everyday stuff. Now basically think about <laughs> Now think about how good or bad an evil chat GPT would be with no guardrails in the absolute wrong hands. And you're kind of getting still nowhere close, basically, to the capability of Dark Bird. Um, now, another sort of weird one. Uh, so I follow lots of sort of cybersecurity news and everything else and sort of, you know, scams and cons and hacks and everything else. Um, this one was actually a, the first time that I've ever seen a regulator being conned. Now, BlackRock, uh, a little while ago, created a cryptocurrency called XRP. Um, and XRP basically is a legitimate cryptocurrency, coin, whatever you want to call it. Um, however, um, the price of XRP went up by 12% all of a sudden, and no one was really sure why. However, it turned out that someone had put a fake filing in with the SEC. And as people look at the filing, you know, filings for different things that uh, get sort of given to the regulators, uh, people saw that uh, there was all of a sudden a BlackRock filing basically for XRP. And people thought, well, this is actually going to lead to some new regulations, you know, maybe a new Bitcoin ETF, you know, all these kinds of other sort of bits and bobs that sort of pop up around this, this conversations in itself. Um, and it sent the it sent the share, well, it sent the price of uh, BlackRock's cryptocurrency skyrocketing. So uh, criminals basically are getting very, very bold in how they, what we call pump and dump cryptocurrencies. Uh, then we've got this on the energy front. Uh, we've got wave power desalination devices. So these are essentially power. These are devices that are sitting in the middle of the ocean. They're powered by wave energy. So it's a renewable form of energy and they desalinate water in situ. Now, this particular one is from Norway. 
And when we have a look at desalination technology, one of the biggest problems that we have with desalination technology is the brine, um, which is it, it's pretty toxic. Um, if you dump waste brine into the sea, then it just kills absolutely everything near it. Um, so this particular desalination technology, they're sort of like little buoys that float in the middle of the ocean, um, pumps the brine back into the device and then mixes it with 80% seawater and then expels it. So you don't actually get loads of dead zones basically around there. Uh, then we've got other kind of things, other fun things. Um, the Pentagon is getting increasingly close to creating fully autonomous hunter-killer weapon systems. Um, they still say that humans in the loop are very, very important, but frankly, let's face it, at some point, basically, we're going to end up having drones that go off and kill things by themselves, basically, without any human pushing the button. We might have human oversight, but basically, the AIs, basically, and the drones and the autonomous weapon systems will actually push the button. And neither the UK, the, neither the United Kingdom, the United States, China, Russia, and a variety of other countries have signed up with the United Nations to ban the development of fully autonomous weapon systems. So think Terminator, that's it, that'll eventually come, because humans are humans, we like doing that kind of stuff. And we're just waiting for someone else to do it, which will then give us the full authority to go and do it ourselves. Um, now, we've got this one here. Now, a little while ago, um, I talked about artificial intelligence being used to socially loaf. So social loafing is a new trend, a new work trend. And what we mean by social loafing is when we tag team people with robots and artificial intelligences that are designed to help them do their work, whatever that work is, maybe you're checking uh, the quality of something on a production line or whatever it happens to be, um, quite a lot of people, it's been found, actually just kind of tune out, you know, and just let the robot take over with the quality checking process while we or I loaf about, you know, uh, in the pants. Now, interestingly enough, when we actually have a look at the role that artificial intelligence will play when it comes to the future of work, um, another study actually showed that when it comes to coding, uh, the use of artificial intelligence as a sort of uh, companion as an assistant, uh, helps programmers enter what is known as the flow state. So on the one hand, we've got AI co-workers tag teamed with people who think they can just tune out while the AIs do the heavy lifting. And on the other hand, we've got individuals that enter a flow state, which is kind of that Zen or Nirvana state where you are just focused on what it is that you are doing, and all of a sudden you find the moment and just excel at whatever it is you're up to. Um, so the use of artificial intelligence to both enable social loafing, but also the ultimate human-focused flow state is really quite interesting to me. Um, another piece of science fiction news, I mean, you can't make this up, and literally none of this is made up, you can check it all. Uh, and I'm kind of going to end up basically on these these last two, but I can keep going on, you know, as you see, the basically this just keeps scrolling and we're already at, you know, whatever number of minutes it is. Um, so in this particular experiment, uh, scientists combined the DNA basically from two animals to create what we call a chimera. Now, a chimera basically is an animal that has two sets of DNA. Um, so we can also they we can also kind of call them transgenic animals. So you know two genes, trans, you know, etc. Um, however, with this particular one, um, one of the sets of DNA that were implanted into uh, the fetuses of monkeys in this particular case contained elements that glowed. Um, so on the one hand, not only do you end up basically with a with a chimeric monkey, you end up with a chimeric monkey that quite literally, at its fingertips, its eyes and everything else, uh, glows green. That's it. So uh, I've, seen, I've seen glowing plants, I've seen glowing cats, never seen a glowing monkey before, but you know, hey, here we are. This is a synthetic biology trend. And then this is not the first time I've seen one of these. Um, we had a company over in China that appointed a robot 
So if you know the Hanson Robotics sort of robots, you know, and so on and so forth, appointed a robot with an AI-based brain. So if you think ChatGPT, for example, shoved into a robot, um, they appointed a robot as their interim CEO. Now, I have seen artificial intelligences being appointed as CEOs, as well as being appointed to the board of essentially sort of financial services organizations, especially basically in Asia, sort of more Hong Kong than anywhere else. Um, and, you know, when we talk about automating the workforce, if you're the CEO of a company like I am, you are also in the future automatable. So CEOs need to be very, very careful how they behave around employees and how they treat their employees. Because just as many CEOs think that their employees are a burden on the P&L and, 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 and there to be automated, the fact of the matter is you as a CEO can also be automated. And anyway, that's, uh, that's a little bit more uh, than I was going to sort of share with you today. Um, but as you see, if you go to the Exponents blog on fanaticalfuturist.com or 311institute.com, uh, you can literally just keep going. And if you want to see all of the future news in one place, this is the only site that lets you do that. There are about 4,000 articles on there. It teams up basically with the books that I write and so on and so forth. Uh, the keynotes that I actually share with you all and everything else, which you can go and have a look at on my uh, YouTube channel. And I hope you enjoyed that little jaunt into the future. And just remember, science fiction is dead. We're already living in a world of science fact. So take care. Goodbye.